Hey guys, welcome to the shop. So today's video is going to be on basic use of a coaxial indicator uh, as pictured in the video you are currently watching. And thank you for watching. I do always appreciate that. So a coaxial indicator is actually a pretty clever tool. Um, it shows you your misalignment on a hole based on how much the needle moves as it as you turn it. Now you can run these under power. I typically prefer not to. I'm just more comfortable, you know, basically turning it and similarly to a four jaw, figuring out where your minimum and maximum contact is and taking out half the error and doing that as you go around. Now, given the surface finish on this hole, I only centered myself to within one thousandths of an inch. Uh, which is sufficient for demonstrations because really in this case, we're just here to show principles. Uh, and once you understand the principles, best practice follows suit. So it's really just a matter of taking your time. Uh, you can run these under power. I typically choose not to. I'm just more comfortable doing it this way. And I, I find it to actually be a little bit faster. Now in a later video, I can demonstrate a tool that clamps onto the spindle nose actually and does functionally the same thing as a coaxial indicator it it's a clone of an indicol indicator holder very effective tool and they're actually quite a bit cheaper and more versatile than a coaxial indicator uh frankly this was an impulse purchase and it was a lot of fun and i don't regret buying it because i do use it and it's gotten some mileage on it, but you know, it's not a tool you need to have, especially getting started. So in a moment, we're just going to cut over to having the mill powered on and I'll start explaining the boring process. Hey guys, welcome back. So I'm just cleaning up the hole with the boring head. You know, we're taking a pretty aggressive cut, which is 10 thousandths, uh, which is a lot in a boring head, at least in mild steel. So we're gonna see how it goes. I think I'll probably give it a shot of oil, but you hear we're not fully engaged. We're close, but not fully engaged. I'm gonna go in with a uh, snap gauge and measure the diameter once we've cleaned up the whole inside surface and at that point what we will do is start really working slowly to board a size because I think what I want to do is one and one eighth inches I think that's going to be a good size but we're very close to completely cleaned up. I think what I'm also going to do is drop my feed because that surface finish isn't great in there. The better your surface finish, the easier it is to measure precisely. It's not great, but no, oh, and this this gauge is a little bit too big. There we are. Snap this guy through. I'm expecting this to be probably 1.1, 1.15 inches. And I was wrong. We have a way to go to one and one eighth. We are at 1.0165 inches. I think what I'm going to do is save you guys the effort of watching the rough boring and jump back to when we're closer to size. Here we are back at the machine. 
I've decided I'm only boring this to one and one sixteenth of an inch because we just, I, I, frankly, I don't want to devote too much time to this, but we're about four thousandths shy. We're at 1.058 inches. So four and a half thou shy. I have jumped the speed considerably, but since this is a finished cut, I'm going to drop the feed considerably. I'm going to power feed in, and this is going to take a couple minutes, so I think we can just hang out and watch. So I think we're going to get within one thousandths of an inch on this. Maybe a little better, maybe a little worse. But what's also going to happen if I'm still undersized, I'm going to put a dial indicator on the boring head mag that down and move it one half of the distance we need to increase. So on this particular boring head, it's graduated in how far you move the head, not how much bigger you make the hole. So you see we just engaged in the part. And we're not taking really all that much material off. I don't know if you can see my head. I like to get a, lo a look at what the surface finish looks like. Because the better the surface finish, the more precise you can measure. And I am sorry for the noise of the machine. I I've lost my microphone today. But I still wanted to record a video for you guys. I think we could just hang out and listen to it for a bit. You know, it. by my math, it's about three or four minutes a pass. So I don't know if you heard that, but that was the burr breaking off in the bottom, that little bit of a squeak. So we're going to shut the machine off and measure. You know, you, I like to listen to the machine because it, it should really just be making a delicate scratching sound when everything's going according to plan. So we're actually, I'm going to say, pretty well and truly bang on. If you read the micrometer when you focus on it, see how we're between the 12 and 13? And when we're on the vernier scale, we're, oh, no, I lost it because I didn't lock well enough. But... See how we're in between the 12 and the 13, and on the vernier scale, we're pretty much bang on between the 5 and the 6. Sorry, I'm looking at the mic, not the camera. So I think that that's not bad for a first try. You know, boring heads 
are pretty straightforward to use. They do take a little bit of setup and a little bit of practice. Uh, you know, if you're like me and you have a little bit of trouble with getting them to repeat, what you can do is just take a dial test indicator and set the probe up on the head and move it one half of the distance you want to enlarge your hole by. But another thing to remember on these two is there's backlash in the screw. So take up your backlash and as much as possible, try not to go backwards and learn your boring head. Because if I take a spring pass on this, which I might do, do just to educate you guys a little bit, is this is going to be oversized uh, had I not retracted the head. So I take advantage of that sometimes in sort of machining things to size, but these are what your chips look like. They're really just these long scraggle muffin things, and they can be pretty disgusting to deal with. Uh, but, you know, boring heads... Just practice. They're pretty simple. Just know your backlash and know that there's a really, yeah, see, we've got about eight or nine thousandths of backlash in this. But just know that you're not, the dial reading on most boring heads, there are exceptions. That's not how much bigger your hole is, that's just how far you're moving the cutter. And that's one of the reasons a dial test indicator helps because as these wear over time, the graduations are no longer accurate. So when the screw wears, you might think you're moving at 10 thousandths of an inch, but you could be moving at 8 thousandths or 12 thousandths. So it's, and that might not even be consistent. So that's just something to bear in mind when you're learning how to do this is just don't trust your graduations all the time. You know, check with a micrometer, check with snap gauges. Uh, I think snap gauges with care are good to half a thousandths of an inch, which is I mean, we're, we're perfectly bang on on this. Uh, we're well within the margin of error and we're well within the arbitrary tolerance I picked, which is plus or minus a thousandths of an inch. So if you guys are interested, I'm happy to record more boring content. Personally, I find it quite interesting. I don't think this is boring. It is boring, but it's not boring. So now that we're also done with all of our dad jokes, again, thanks for watching guys. It's always a pleasure sharing this stuff with you.